Hello there, ATS 570s2 students, and this is Dr. Shragi, and I am just going through with you uh, the uh, the presentation that is the review for exam one in ATS 572, and it's just a selection of some slides that we have seen in earlier in the semester, um, and most of this is stuff that's actually quite clearly explained on the review sheet as well, but just to kind of tie it back together to stuff that we have seen in previous lectures. Um, if we go back to lecture one, we see that one of the things that we need to talk about is the two main ways that we can describe rotation in the atmosphere. There is circulation, which is a macroscopic measure of rotation on a finite area, or there's vorticity, which is defined at a point. It's a microscopic measure of rotation. And uh, we had a, we kind of actually avoided saying the th circulation theorem itself. You might remember we just sort of briefly mentioned that the circulation theorem itself is about changes in circulation, but we kind of talked about it more in the context of just defining circulation and how circulation is that path integral. Um, is that a path integral or a line integral? I always forget. Uh, as the uh, as we go around a path along a closed loop in a counterclockwise way, we did some examples and we did examples that were horizontal and we talked about like the circulation around a rectangle or the circulation around some circle, but it also works vertically. I mean, you can make the circulation around some vertical circulation feature like the sea breeze or the Hadley circulation or so on. That was a contrast to vorticity. Now remember there were a couple of different ways to define vorticity. Um, if you just want to think about vorticity as the curl of the wind, del cross and then a three dimensional wind vector, be that absolute or relative, uh, you can get two different measures of vorticity, absolute vorticity, omega a, and relative vorticity, omega, uh, just regular omega, and that is a way of defining vorticity, although in practice only the vertical component of that tends to be what we're interested in on synoptic scales, and so typically what we do is we take k hat dot that cross product to give us our two main ways that we define relative, I'm sorry, that we define vorticity as scalars. Zeta being relative vorticity and eta, that little n looking thing, as being the absolute vorticity. Make sure you know things like what are the units of this and so on. Um, so if we continue on, then we can see how there is a connection between relative vorticity and circulation. You know, circulation applies to an area, but as you get that area smaller and smaller and smaller, as you bring it down closer and closer to a point, then you get a value closer and closer to the relative vorticity at that point. Um, there was a vorticity equation, which like the circulation theorem was really about the change in vorticity. The vorticity equation is about cha rate of change of vorticity. And we actually worked through and got ourselves into different forms of vorticity. Um, make sure you understand this business about how we wanted to work with vorticity as a scalar in synoptic scale meteorology and how we can actually have these different definitions of zeta and eta. Um, you do need to have these kinds of definitions memorized. Uh, they're not uh, terribly difficult though. Notice that there's F there, which we had been calling in the past the Coriolis parameter, although another perfectly legitimate interpretation is to say that F is the planetary vorticity. It's the vorticity an object has, or an air parcel has, just due to the fact that it's on a sphere that is rotating about its axis and so on. And we actually went through and kind of worked through some little um, cartoons that illustrated why planetary vorticity is zero at the equator and it gets biggest as you get closer to the poles and so on. Make sure you know how to do all that. Uh, we had four different ways to define relative vorticity. There was like as a um, dot product and there, I'm sorry, a cross product and there was a one with a k hat dot and so on. And there was one that was just in component form, um, negative v, I'm sorry, uh, partial v, partial x minus partial u, partial y, if I remember correctly. But we had a fourth way to describe relative vorticity that was about natural coordinates. And make sure you can work through and understand all these different terms and what they mean about shear vorticity and curvature vorticity and so on. Um, all right, so we were talking about vorticity equation as a way of describing um, cyclogenesis. And it's a nifty little equation because, um, you know, it just has that partial zeta, partial t on the left-hand side. It's it's a nice way of describing cyclogenesis, the change in vorticity at location. And it certainly has some things in it that we liked to look at, like uh, the advection of vorticity, for example. And there was even a beta term and so on. But then there's other things in there, like a stretching term, which we talked about how a stretching term worked, or uh, how it worked in the vertical direction when you stretch like the updraft of a thunderstorm or something like that. We also talked about how one of its terms is the tilting term, 
where horizontal vorticity can, um, can get tilted up into becoming regular um, relative vorticity, or helicity can get tilted into becoming uh, relative vorticity, to use the right term there. We talked about how there is a solenoid term in the vorticity equation, where if you have um, a baroclinic atmosphere where contours of pressure, isobars, are crossing contours of density, that is isopicnics, you have the generation of vorticity from these uh, this baroclinicity, whereas a barotropic atmosphere wouldn't have this. Um, let's see here, where did I go? There we go. Um, we also could continue forward in that uh, that third lecture and talk about how that beta term worked. Remember, the beta term is that term that really is basically just the advection of planetary vorticity, which shows then that anytime you have a wind from the north, you're bringing more planetary vorticity to the location where you are. You are getting um, that is positive vorticity advection. It's cyclogenic. A south wind always contributes to cyclolysis and so on. Um, we have that online lecture that was about geostrophic vorticity and gradients and Laplacians and so on. Um, most of that kind of stuff wouldn't be like an explicit question so much as in, I mean, I don't know how you would answer a lot of the questions if you didn't know what a gradient was, or if you didn't have a sense of what a Laplacian meant at different kinds of locations. Like in this case, we have a minimum, and so the Laplacian of this height here is positive and so on. Um, we also talked then about this definition of geostrophic vorticity, where geostrophic vorticity has nothing to do directly with the winds. It's actually about the pattern of the heights. And then we're making this assumption that the winds are going to be following the height, um, even though that means that they're curved and stuff, which strictly speaking is not exactly kosher for a geostrophic situation. Um, again, I don't think I'm going to have you actually compute a Laplacian at, you know, using a finite difference form and so on. You did stuff like that back in ATS 570. But on the other hand, there may be situations where it's helpful to you to remember, oh, I could at least get the sign of it by understanding how the sum of the four corners is more than four times the middle and things like that. Then we moved on to our development equations, and the first one was the height tendency equation. You certainly do not have to have these equations memorized. All four of the, vorticity, of the development equations will be given to you on the front page of the test. You can use them for whatever you need to use them for. Um, you don't have to have them memorized or anything like that. You certainly don't have to derive any of them either. But you do, know that you do need to know how to interpret things like that fancy three-dimensional Laplacian on the left-hand side of the height tendency equation or how to interpret things like the vorticity advection terms in the height tendency equation. These terms can help you understand things like whether a trough and ridge system will propagate or retrograde, depending on the vorticity advection that's happening, because you see how the, vortic the relative vorticity advection works against the, uh, the beta term. And so depending on which term is bigger, you're going to either have a propagating system or a retrograding system. You can also interpret that in the context of like jet stream digging. When a real sharp trough is out there and a jet streak is moving into it, you can get the jet the trough get to get dip, deeper quickly um, because of uh, the height tendency equation. We talked about the invert interpretation of these different terms. Notice that the height tendency equation tells us something that the other equi development equations did not, namely that the vertical distribution of the heating mattered. Um, we had terms in here like warming increasing with respect to height, or cooling decreasing with respect to height, or warming decreasing with respect to height, and so on. Make sure you know those. Okay, then we moved on to Hirschberg Fritsch, and Hirschberg Fritsch had this sneaky lid assumption in it. Make sure you know what the lid assumption was, why we had to make it, or what it means for us, and so on. But once you have the Hirschberg Fritsch equation, again, we don't need to derive it, and you don't need to memorize it. I'm providing it to you on the front page of the test. Well, then you need to be able to like interpret things like why did that heating in that layer make the bottom of the layer get closer to the ground? Why did heights fall? Um, why was it more effective if the heating was higher up in the atmosphere and lower in or less effective if it was lower? How do we interpret that in terms of like a deep layer of heating where um, most of the heating is actually happening below the bottom of our layer and so on? Um, Notice that there was no dynamics in the hirschberg fritsch equation. There was no vorticity or vorticity advection or whatever. Well, the hirschberg fritsch would say, yes, there is. It's just hidden in there. It's hidden there in the form of um, 
the the temp you know like the temperature advection happens around a cyclone and the cyclone is where the vorticity is happening but the the the, the vorticity itself according to Hirschberg Fritsch isn't what's changing the heights it's the thermodynamics um that's very different than what Pedersen Sutcliffe says now Pedersen Sutcliffe did need that lit assumption but they did need us to be able to define something called the level of non-divergence which can in and of itself be a very difficult thing to define but we got ourselves to a form of the of the Hirsch, of sorry of the Pedersen Sutcliffe equation. Again, you don't need to derive it and you don't need to memorize it. It will be on the front page of the test. You'll just have to do things with it. And um, this change in geostrophic vorticity at the surface is hard to think about. Excuse me. Until you realize what it's really talking about is just the formation of closed isobars. Uh, geostrophic vorticity is about how closed the features are. Is the wind going around and around in like a circle as, as it flows around isobars? And so this is really about psych, uh, cyclogenesis in the sense that you and I are thinking about it, the formation of cyclones. And if we um, then took a look at this here, we could see that there were differences between what Hirschberg Fritsch said about the distribution of heating and what Pedersen Sutcliffe. Both of them said that it was about heating, you know, in this layer, but Pedersen Sutcliffe is very clear that it isn't uniform heating that matters. It's the Laplacian of heating. You have to have a focused area of maximum heating for the uh, Pedersen Sutcliffe equation to tell us the cyclogenesis is going to be happening. And we actually worked through this business. You know, like over here on the right, that's supposed to be uniform heating, whereas on the left, that is like a, a, an area of heating. And we talked about the differences in the interpretation between the two equations and so on. And then similarly, we, when we talked about like the dynamic terms, like vorticity advection and so on, in Pedersen Sutcliffe, it only mattered at the level of non divergence, which is why we make things like 500 millibar charts with absolute vorticity contours and height contours on them. We want to be able to make some kind of approximation to the uh, absolute vorticity advection. All right, Zwackakasi was our final development equation. Um, we started with a form of, the, of one of the steps along the way for the Pedersen-Sutcliffe equation and made a few different assumptions and rearranged the terms and integrated it vertically, and you end up with this form of the Zwackakasi equation. Again, no need to memorize it. It's no need to derive it. That's not the point. It's working with it. Um, notice that it had slightly different things to say. Unlike Hirschberg, Rich, and Pedersen, Sutcliffe, Zwack Akasi specifically said that actually things like vorticity advection, negative V dot del eta, it does not matter what level of the atmosphere it happens. All the vorticity advection at any level works for being cyclogenic. That makes sense. It should be probably any, any level. Uh, same with like vertical distribution of heating. Now, we worked through the business of all of this, how that double integral in the vertical component works and so on. We showed how some of the layers were less effective, but they were added more times. And other layers were more effective, but were added fewer times. And it doesn't exactly work out that every single layer of the atmosphere is equally effective according to Zouak Akasi, but it is actually not that far off. Basically, any place in the atmosphere you have heating, be that diabatic heating, adiabatic heating, advection, whatever, you are resulting in cyclogenesis uh, effects at the surface. So then we had like a handout and we actually went over some of this stuff showing like the differences between the four different development equations and what each of them tells us about the role of vorticity advection. The difference between what each of them told us about the role of heating in the atmosphere and so on. And really that's all we had to do. You just needed to get through all that kind of stuff and, and go study the handout and you'll be ready to take the test. All right, please let me know if you have any questions about this and I'm sorry for the delays in getting this information to you guys. All right, we'll talk to you later. This has been Dr. John Schrocking.